Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 485. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast, the podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because we are going to talk about, well, probably one of my most favorite subjects, but more importantly, one of the most important subjects that you need to know. And we're going to hear it from an individual that I have known for quite some time and actually was very formative and when it came down to learning what I would call one of the most fundamental skill sets necessary for every entrepreneur. And of course, we all know I'm going to be talking about sales. Oh, wait, did somebody hang up? No, I'm just kidding. I know I said the S word. Sales is okay, guys. It's exactly what you need. And more importantly, it breathes life into the business. And most importantly, the individual who's going to be sharing his wisdom and information with you today is going to be the one that I say, if if you are listening, if you are ready, you will have a transformative experience right now for your business. Who am I talking about? I am talking about none other than Jeffrey Gittimer. He's an internationally recognized sales, customer loyalty, and personal development speaker. He is an author, written more books than uh, I can even remember and count. But the one that I know him for is the Little Red Book of Selling. If you have read that, oh my gosh, then you know the fun that we're about to have. You know the truth that we're about to have. In fact, he's written a new book called Truthful Living because he's partnered with the Napoleon Hill Foundation to be able to do exactly that. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to learn today. You're going to love him today. But most importantly, I'm going to go out on the limb and say that you're going to learn something that you'll be able to put into action immediately. And most importantly, it'll also help you become a bigger, better, badder person. So let's get ready to listen and to learn and to love Jeffrey Gittimer. Jeffrey, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Jay. And yourself? So Thank far? You for, by the way, thank you for setting such low expectations. <laughs> I totally appreciate that. Hey, you, 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 if you're going to sell millions of copies and, yeah, and change true. lives for, yeah. for decades, I, I'm going to make sure that they know that now is one of those moments when their life should be changed. That that should be their minimum expectation. Because... It makes me happy and proud whenever I can help somebody, like really, really help them. That makes me the happiest. Exactly. And that and that's exactly what I know is going to happen. You can't help but do that. So now th this being the first time that you're here, I have to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody the first time that they're here. You ready? Yes. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, Superman, etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and because mm -hmm. uh, I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common, chief among them, uh, there's as an entrepreneur, occasionally, I can envision myself, you know, saving our customers with our products and services. And yes, maybe I am wearing a cape. But at the same time, like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. You know, uh, think yep. Spider-Man, for example. There was a time where he was just a kid going to school, doing his thing, taking some photos and trying to earn some pizza money. But then one day he gets bit by a spider, discovers he's got some sort of special gift and gets to choose. Do I use it for good or for evil? So my question to you is as follows. Before... You know, your your current book, Truthful Living, before the little bit red book of selling, before being known as a sales guy, before being the, the speaker, writer, dad you are, before being known as Jeffrey Gittimer, what we want to know is, who is Jeffrey Gittimer? Formerly, I'm disguised as Clark Kent. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a family of business people. 
I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm a businessman. Hmm. My grandfather was a businessman. My father was a businessman. And I have followed in their footsteps. I was given good genes. My mom and dad and most of our family is very smart. So I was born smart. And then I had to decide how I was going to use that intelligence for good or for evil. And I chose good. I chose writing. I chose speaking. And for myself, I chose learning. So, you know, I've run that gamut pretty much my entire life. But let me share with your audience immediately something that they can do that I've done hmm. for the past 25 years. I wake up in the morning and I do one or all of five things. I read, I write, I prepare, and that, those three things cause me to think and create. So read, write, prepare, think, create. I've done that for 25 years, and so far I have written 15 books and given 2,500 speeches. So it's working. I'm going to do it for another 25 years, and then that's it. I'm going to quit. But I'm challenging the audience that when they wake up in the morning, they pretty much do nothing for themselves. And while they're sleeping or while they're fumbling around for their phone so they can check their email, I'm making money. And I think that those things are choices. Everyone wakes up and has a choice. Right. If you're going to have a good day or you're going to have a bad day, if it's, you know, whatever the day is outside, it doesn't really matter. It's what's going on in your head. Everyone knows that. But what do you do with your allocated time? Not your managed time, your allocated time. You allocate an hour in the morning to yourself. And people are going, well, I got kids. You know what? I have a nine-year-old daughter and I walk her to school. Um, I'm with her every other week. So every week, including this morning, we park a few blocks away from the school and walk. And then I pick her up in the afternoon and we walk back to the car. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So don't tell me you got kids. That's a bunch of crap. Everybody has some kind of necessary diversion. The question is, how do you dedicate time to yourself? How do you devote time to yourself? How do you allocate time to yourself to become more successful? Yeah, I like that. Now, there's something that you said at the beginning that I want to understand because you made a distinction that I, I would love to hear you elaborate upon. You sure. said, and I quote, I am not an entrepreneur. I am a businessman. There's a mm -hmm. distinction there. I would yeah. love to hear what that distinction. Uh, to me, a businessman who is someone who's family has been in business for themselves for generations. My grandfather had a plumbing and heating supply business. My father manufactured kitchen cabinets and countertops and metal parts for the government. I ran his manufacturing plant at the age of 19, 100 employees unionized. And, I, you know, I, <laughs> it was in the 60s and, and it was a different time, but I'm telling you, uh, when you're 19 years old and you're managing 100 people, you you have a challenge. <laughs> Entrepreneurs, on the other hand, are someone whose mom was a teacher, whose dad worked for General Electric for 30 years, and they bought a franchise. That's an entrepreneur to me. Got it. Got it. Got it. And, oh. and you know, it's a, it's a slight distinction, but, you know, I don't consider Jeff Bezos an entrepreneur. I consider him a businessman. Or Steve Jobs, he was an entrepreneur, he was a businessman, and ran a multi-billion dollar business. Mine is only multi-million dollars, but it's still, it's a business, and it's an enterprise, mm -hmm. and I'm the head of that enterprise, and I'm a businessman. My franchise is not for sale. That that's that's okay for now. I mean, yeah. but everything's. Just, I've but hold on, I thought everything was for sale. What do you mean? Yeah, it is. I've I've <laughs> licensed. People can use my material. But there, you can't buy my intellectual property. There's no amount of money. Yeah, understood, understood, understood. So uh, I, take us on this journey, if you will. Because as you said, you, you've written 15, 15 books, 2,500 speeches. Uh, do you just wake up one day and, and go, you know what? I'm going to be a writer. Is that literally, now, was that the genesis? Know, what was, that. How did that work? Uh, I started out in business for myself. Uh, I manufactured uh, leisure furniture in the late 60s, and I manufactured imprinted sportswear in the, in the early 70s, and I went to New York City and banged on doors and made sales. Oh, yes. So yeah. you, can't, you can't rise to the level 
that I've risen to without actually having done it. <laughs> Don't tell me that, you know, you can't be the son of a great guy and be a great guy unless you have done the work. So I've done the work. Um, you know, I had factories. Um, I carried stuff on my back to Manhattan. I cold called major buyers in, in major stores and major companies, sold millions of dollars, not thousands, millions of dollars worth of goods. And, uh, you know, I have the war stories to prove it. Because some people won't tell you the truth. Some people won't pay for what they bought. Some people uh, will lie to you more than you will lie to them. And that's New York. I don't think I could, I couldn't do what I do had I not had my comeuppance in Manhattan. And people from California don't understand that because they have a car that they polish and they stand and sit in traffic. <laughs> Yes. No um, offense. None taken. I, I gave up a car years ago because it was costing me money to actually drive. Right. So ridiculous. It, it, it's like, no, there's no sense in, in, well, in doing I live, that. I, I, Jay, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. I've, I've lived here for 30 years. But uh, during that time, I've maintained some residences every once in a while in New York City. I was just there for the better part of the last three years and, you know, had an apartment and it, it, made more calls and made more deals and had more business. But if you're not Manhattan familiar, you can't build your business. Well, I don't want to say can't, but I'm going to say, just say you can build it faster, better in Manhattan because all the things you need are within five blocks mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Understood. or an Uber ride. <laughs> an Uber ride. It's an Uber ride away. Not taxi, Uber ride. Interesting. Right. There's mm -hmm. more Uber drivers right now in Manhattan than there are taxi drivers. Which, it, it, which is, uh, again, I love uh, as things continue to progress and make things happen. Now, speaking of making things happen, that's what every entrepreneur wants to do. And you mentioned one of my, you, you've actually mentioned two of what has become my favorite ways of, of getting business done. You, you were talking about banging on doors and cold calling. Two things mm -hmm. traditionally people would go, I want none of either. Right. Um, yet... I still think that this the, not only is this a lost art, but I still think it's necessary today, even though we have all these other ways of connecting and communicating. What say you? I'll give you a sound bite. Cold calling is a lousy place to make a sale, but it's a great place to learn how to sell. Yes. And so if you're if you're willing to take no for an answer and men have faced rejection way more than women. Uh, think back, boys, to high school, backseat of a car. <laughs> How many no's were you willing to take back then to try to make a sale? Um, but, but the bottom line is that you have to be able to engage people, get to a decision maker, have something to say once you get there. It challenges every one of your intellectual uh, nodes in your, in your head, and you have to be able to do it in a way that can engage people enough to where they want to buy and not sell them. Engage them enough to where they want to buy. My my mantra has always been: people don't like to be sold, but they love to buy. I've actually trademarked the phrase. But what? So so why does, in your opinion, why 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 does sales even get such a bad rep, reputation? Why do people have this negative neuro association? This immediate, oh my god, I don't want to do yeah. that. Do you own when, a car? Do I own a car? Yeah. Or did have you ever bought a car? I have, but I dislike so, the process. Right, exactly. Everyone does. No <laughs> one, everyone does internet research now before they get, they don't want to talk to a car sales guy. He's like a, not a, not a good guy. And he uh, uses old world sales tactics and you don't want to hear those. Or if you, even if you're going to buy a mobile home or a, a, you know, one of those vacation Winnebago things or anything where a real estate thing where they're, where it's a high ticket item and they need to make a sale to you before you go see somebody else. And so there, there's pressure involved, there's guilt involved, there's manipulation involved. That's not how I teach. I teach people to engage and then first to attract rather than go out. I teach them to attract people. Um, you know, you, you call me or I don't know how we hooked up to be able to do this interview, but, you know, I get the interview because of who I am. You Google me and you go, oh, shit, I got to talk to this guy. And. I've been posting things online since there was online. <laughs> and I try my best to put value out into the marketplace. And when I do, people call. 
of the 2,500 speeches that I've given, I've never made a sales call. People call me up and go, hey, you, you wrote that sales Bible, didn't you? Or you wrote that little red book of selling, didn't you? I go, yeah. Yeah, we're having a sales meeting. I was wondering if you give speeches. Right. And, and that happens several times a week. Right. And it, But it's only been happening for the last 25 years, so it's not – I don't know if it's going to work yet. <laughs> it's a fad. It's a fad, actually. Right. It's a fad, right. <laughs> but it's a consistent fad if I am consistent in my value message offerings. So if you're – uh, a, a listener and you're trying to build your business and you're trying to build your reputation, you can't do it by tweeting once a week or posting once a month. It doesn't work like that. You have to do it daily is best. Weekly is the minimum. You know, we have a podcast that's grown. Sell or die is our podcast. For those of you out there who are looking for a sales podcast, go on any one of the, 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 uh, podcast outlets and take a look at it and subscribe to it. And while you're at it, you know, give us a five-star rating. But I would challenge you that we have gone from one day a week to five days a week in under a year. And we are now at, we're, we're going to get a hundred thousand downloads this month. Think that's, about that. Uh, it's, it's unheard of. That's what I tell. I, I, I tell, I've, I've told a lot of my students, a lot of people that uh, you, it, you have to find ways to go out there to keep the message going and to make right. it consistent. And, and Jay, yes, Jay, sir? Yeah. there's a lot of cheap bastards out there. So let me give them a message. Okay. It's free. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Right. <There's, laughs> you, you invest your time and maybe a little bit of equipment, but if you have an iPhone, you're pretty much ready to go. I, but, but yet that even that is met with some resistance and disbelief. Uh, right. And, and go it, get a job. Like crazy. At, the, at the Suncoast Mall and, you know, piss people off over there. <laughs> it's good either way. No. So when it comes down to it, as many, many entrepreneurs progress through their business, they run into various sets of hurdles. Uh, first, it's them. They, you know, chief. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I call CEO chief everything officer. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's where you are. That's the stage. Mm -hmm. But there comes at a point at which, well, you're not doing everything, and and at some point you got to let go of the baby, i.e., the sales process, and have somebody else doing that. And then they tend to experience having resistance of helping other people get through that process of, you know, actually getting a good salesperson. So my question to you is how on earth as, as an entrepreneur, does someone hire and or train or find their sales superstar that can help them or be as anywhere, just be 80%, maybe even 70% as good as they are uh, to go out there and represent and, and do exactly what we're talking about. Well, the first thing that the, the entrepreneur or the business person has to realize is that they have to let go of some of the things that they think the business can't live without them. I can promise you the business can live without you for almost anything unless you're an artist. You know, unless you mm -hmm. have a, a supreme mm -hmm. capability that, that nobody else. Well, but, well hold on, hold on, hold on. You could say that sales is an art. I mean, I would say that. No, to I somebody. could Why I not? Say it. Okay, it's why not? It well, it's a, it's a science, but it also yeah. has an art to it. Yeah, the art is, if there is an art, is never letting the other person feel like they're being sold. Agreed. That's the art. Agreed. Everything else is, the questions are science, the the, uh, the completion of a sale is a science, maintaining a relationship is a science, uh, building rapport with someone is a science. It's all written in books and it has been for 100 years about what to do and how to do it. But the art is to be able to make certain that you are perceived as a normal, likable, <laughs> believable, trustworthy salesperson. I like you. I believe you. I have confidence in you. And I trust you. Therefore, I may buy from you. That's the art part. I'm I'm chuckling right now because those that have been following me for any length of time are probably going, oh, my God, that's where Jay got that from. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> they, I always tell people, like, look, you don't want to be perceived as a salesperson, but you want to be a person who happens to sell things. Uh, because at the end of the day, that that's, that's what it comes down to. Now, I, again, my frame of reference for you is all tied up in, in into sales. But the the new 
book, the title at least, would lend me to believe it has something to do with other than sales. I mean, Truthful Living, the first writings of Napoleon Hill. So it, it, share with us, if you will, what's, where did the desire for, for such a book come from and, and why do it? All right, everybody, thanks for listening, and I'm glad that you are enjoying what you are hearing thus far. But here's one of the things that's really important. One of the most important things that you can do is get started. One of the things that I've said before, and I say again, once you get started, stay started. But more importantly, there can be lots of roadblocks to getting started. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove one of those roadblocks for you and make it a little bit easier. Because the thing that I don't want to stop you is thinking, do I need a local number? How about a long distance number? Or should it be 800? How on earth am I going to make that happen so that people can contact me as I'm out there building my business, making my cash flow grow, but most importantly, understanding that it doesn't have to be difficult. Many of you may know, but if you don't, there's a company out there by the name of Grasshopper. And what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Grasshopper is the entrepreneur's phone system. It works like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware to purchase, no software to install. It's just the number that flat works. So if you are out there building that distributed workforce across many different locations, it's a way for you to still go out there and make your number be unified, simple, easy to use, something we've been using for quite some time. So again, go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Now, let's get back to the rest of the story. Well, I've been, Napoleon Hill gave me my positive attitude. I read Think and Grow Rich in 1972, 10 times mm. with a bunch of other sales guys that were learning to sell. And we did a book report on one chapter a day mm. for a full year. Mm. And the book only has 15 chapters. So every, we're going through the book every you know, one to one and a half times a month. And after a while, you get it. You understand what the philosophy of Hill was and you understand his challenges and you understand his desire to help other people by following in his, um, not necessarily in his footsteps, but certainly in his beliefs and philosophies. And I did. And got a positive attitude, ran a bunch of successful businesses. And fast forward from that, about uh, 72, about 30 years. Hmm. And I met the head of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I said, hey, you know, I really owe you a debt of gratitude. Um, Napoleon Hill gave me my, my positive attitude. Could I possibly do something for the foundation? He said, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I, I have a weekly email magazine. And right now my weekly email magazine is at about 250,000 copies, uh, you know, uh, subscribers a week. Let me do one for Napoleon Hill. I'll do it no charge. Um, and you don't have to pay me anything. Just let me do a good job. Now I've been doing that every, every Friday, uh, uh for 15 years. And, uh, so far that's working. <laughs> and when they came across Napoleon Hill's first writings, they offered me to edit it and annotate it. And I said, sure. So I got, I was given value by having given value for 15 years. They gave me an opportunity because I gave value first. An incredible uh, replication of Napoleon Hill's philosophy. When it comes down to it, though, there, you, you could have done anything. Uh, oh yeah. It, uh, why? That I mean, it could have been in, you. It, it, this could have been a, for lack of a better way of putting it, a a sales a, a sales slanted book on, from from it could from have the been, but, look, but it was. No, I just I took his original words, yeah, which were put into a course in 1917 in Chicago, and all I did was annotate them. I didn't add anything to his words. I put my own words in to sort of make it 21st century. But every place my words appear in there, I make it different type so we can make it happen. So when it came down to it, was there ah anything that going through this, was there anything that you learned? I mean, you've been practicing for so many decades. You've been around the information for, for such a long time. I learned What's in a there for hell of a lot. Oh, yeah. there's there's life changing 
I should say, life-enhancing elements in the book that will challenge everybody to think, smile, and do better. Did you say That's think, the best smile, thing I say. and do better? Yeah, because he, ha <laughs> he has things in here that are, are, there's nothing revolutionary, like, oh my God, I never thought about desire. But the way he explains it makes you have a stronger desire or recognize that you have it, but you haven't really used it to the best of your ability. Care to give us an idea or a sample of what you mean specifically yeah. when it comes to desire? Because yeah. I, I know that there's a number of people like struggling with that. Just what with the words you just said, they're like, what do you mean? What do you want to do and how bad do you want to do it? And then what are you willing to do in order to be able to fulfill that element of, of uh, uh, emotion in your body? It's an emotion. Desire is an emotion. Mm -hmm. And some people want it bad and some people don't. But when uh, I ask people, take a, I'll, hold on. Okay, okay go Desire ahead. was the Eagles winning the Super Bowl, correct? I don't, Are you with me? I'm I'm with you. I just they don't follow football. They desired it way more than the <laughs> New England piece of shit Patriots. <laughs> well, yeah, that's usually the case in in a sporting event. Whoever wins desired it more. Yes. There's an entrepreneur here in Charlotte, uh, who had a food truck that sold cheesesteaks. And I found it somehow, was just walking down the main street in town, and I bought it, and I loved, oh no, I was at a food truck party or something, and I found there, and they said where they were, and I went and found them another time, and I bought a few cheesesteaks from them. And I said, what are you doing here? Get a store, get a, get a restaurant. And one day they opened up a restaurant, tripled their business that on the best day they ever had, tripled their business the first day, sold the food truck the first week. And they've been in a store, you know, a restaurant ever since. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah, I ate a cheesesteak there two days ago, and I said, come on, where's my shirt? And he brought me over one today. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, you gave him advice that, that you at least yeah. gave him advice worth the shirt. I, I challenged him about how good he was because people, and this is one of the other things of Napoleon Hill, is self-belief and self-confidence. Most people don't have that self-confidence or that self-belief unless it is foisted upon them by somebody else. At some point, somebody told Elon Musk, you're on the right track, or somebody told Jeff Bezos, you're on the right track, because they both went broke physically, if not mentally, several times. And all of a sudden, it worked. You know, you could have bought Amazon for two, I could have bought Amazon for two bucks a share, or, or Apple for two bucks a share. But the, the bottom line is, I try my best to help other people. That's part of my philosophy. And if I can instill greater belief in them, look what I've done. Look what the heck I've done. Okay. And I don't ask. I don't. I pay for my cheesesteak just like everybody else. He doesn't give me anything for free because I don't ask for anything for free. In fact, if he started to give me cheesesteaks for nothing, I wouldn't take them. I'd still pay him. Right. You know, there's something that you that keeps being an, an, an undercurrent in everything in and. In, in, of of who you are and how you speak and i just mm -hmm. want to make sure that everybody picks up on it um uh, and and you seem to have developed a philosophy of deposit before withdrawal i.e I, I will give and give and give without much expectation knowing I don't that have someone any expectation I and don't have any expectation. i can hear it and that and i just want to make sure that other people are hearing that same thing but i also know that someone is saying right now as as we're talking about that they're going well what if I'm in a situation where I can't afford to keep giving and I actually need to have an expectation at the same time? How, how, how can they make this transition and, and, and switch? You have to do a combination of both. You can't only give. At some point, you have to make a sale. But I, but I, can, I can tell you that uh, if you decide you want to give, like, for example, salespeople ask me, well, Jeffrey, what's the best way to get a referral? And the best way to get a referral is give one <laughs> because then the person feels that sort of sense of obligation. Like they yep. got to return the favor. Yep. I don't want to ask for it. I just want to stick guilt in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so, yes. but, but he, he, here's the, here's the real deal. All of that giving value stuff or the giving advice stuff that I gave to Clover Joe, I learned it from Napoleon Hill. Understood. And those are the, the, that's the essence of the process that I'm trying to convey in Truthful Living. So I'm going to give the, your, your listeners one uh, a brief example from the book. Please. Lesson number 15. There's 23 lessons in the book. Okay. 
there's five words that he says define someone's ability to become successful. The first one is imagination. The second one is desire. The third one is enthusiasm. The fourth one is self-confidence. And the fifth one is concentration. Now think about that. Is there anything like, wait, did you just say, did you just say concentration? Like, dude, there's nothing new about what he's saying. But when you put all five of those together, it's a very powerful formula. I imagine it where he says thoughts are things, mm -hmm. like you think about something and then it becomes reality. No one invented the sewing machine without thinking about it for maybe years right. or the phone or the TV or anything else or the Tesla. <laughs> right. Um, and then if I desire it bad enough, I'm going to go try to do it. And if I show enough enthusiasm, it becomes transferable. If I show that enthusiasm with self-confidence, it becomes buyable. But the glue is my concentration. How willing am I to concentrate on this process, on this thing that I desire in order to be able to make it happen? It's a complete formula. You don't need anything else. You don't you actually don't need to close the sale. If you're so enthusiastic and so committed, the other guy will buy. Yeah. Ab <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I'm the what it comes down to, though, I, I think for a, a lot of individuals, it's, it's figuring out or feeling like um, if I get committed to something, how do I know that I'm committed to the right? You thing? don't know it. Well, there's one way of knowing it. OK, if you don't love it, what the hell are you trying to do it for? Right. So my <laughs> you really realize to draw the, hold it's up, really easy you... to draw the line. If you're thinking, man, I think I can make a lot of money doing this. Don't do that. Mm. You're not going to make a lot of money. You're going to make a little bit of money. But if you love something, you can make a ton of money. What's funny is that uh, I I think some I think a whole lot of people just quit their job. <laughs> well, do you think, wait, wait, do you think Aaron Judge got into baseball because he thought he could make a lot of money or because he loved baseball? Mm, love baseball exactly <laughs> and but think of any athlete they all love right. the sport well they did and, at the oh, beginning by the way they made a lot of money yeah they, they did at the beginning some maybe find out i mean because i've had that experience where i'm like oh yeah. I, I enjoyed this but as i get into it for for example for me it was photography i love i still do love photography but i cannot stand when people want to pay me to take photos of them i'm like i just don't want i did that somehow it ruins it for me um, but you know, Hey, if you well, there's always a chance you're going to screw it up and you won't have earned the money, <laughs> but, but you, what you can do is say, listen, I'm going to do this work for free. And if you like it or you love it, then you will figure out what my, what, what a payment would look like. Um... And that way you're not taking it for money. You're taking it for love and it turns into money. Yeah. You, you got a point. You got a point, especially <laughs> portraits. Um, there's a guy here in Charlotte, mm -hmm. um, uh, St. John Photography. The, he goes to school and he takes pictures of kids, you know, the class pictures. Oh, yeah. Of them not looking. He takes picture, candid yep. pictures yep. of them doing something. Right. And I'm telling you something. It's unbelievable. No, I have pictures of my kids and my grandkids from from this guy that are beyond belief. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, that's the essence is show me the emotion. You know, show me something that makes me go, oh, my God, that's so beautiful. Um, so I, I, I think that's where you have to be. You have to be so committed to it that you become emotional about it because that emotion will create the enthusiasm, create the self-confidence, create the desire and and you're you're off to the races. Okay. So let's let's have this small chat then because this has happened a number of times and in today's marketplace mm -hmm. and or at least the stories that you hear about you you hear about the stories where it it sounds like or at least the way the story is reported. So and so 15, 17, 19 year old, 23 year old, whatever uh just it, it, what feels like got there gets to the their end point or some point of success relatively quickly they and there can be this attitude of hey i've i've been working at this for six whole months but nothing has happened right. uh, <laughs> dude dude call thomas edison on the phone 
I know, right? Um, <laughs> but but there's also the the people that that were passionate about um, posting photographs online. They created a program called Instagram, right? And Facebook comes along, pays them a billion dollars for somebody that never made a damn dime. It's, and but, now they're gazillionaires. Well, yeah, but the question becomes is when you are when, when we have we have limited resource of time mm-hmm. and limited resource of energy mm-hmm. we I'm can right. all be enthusiastic about a number of different things how does one decide pick when it's time to something switch something you love well, well if you love multiple things how do i know which one to pick oh come on you know it in a heartbeat <laughs> i'm messing with you okay. you know it in a heartbeat okay. if you love photography i i, I love it more than you. i probably should for someone who is not a professional photographer go monetize yes. it no, oh, no, I don't. I can't. I, it doesn't work for me. We're, oh, we're oh. so the the photos on our Instagram are my photos, and that's why that's don't enough you do this? Me. Why don't you call yourself the amateur photographer that hardly makes any money but is willing to accept yours? Because <laughs> that, that that's funny. Um, yeah, that's that, 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 that that's funny. Oh, uh, but you know, it it is what it is. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs out there have a number of different things. I mean, I enjoy helping people make their transformations, become Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, building their skill sets, uh, seeing their business go from zero to anything that allows them to quit their job is like my life in so many ways. Um, It's just that I I don't I don't have that same level of passion for photography, although I enjoy it. But I, I hear what you're saying. At the same so, time, go ahead. So, so let me throw something at the audience right now. Yes, if you're tr- if you're wanting to be an entrepreneur or a self owned business person or go into business for yourself or you have some some idea, on October the thirtieth, Truthful Living is going to show up on Amazon.com. It will give you foundational information that will help you understand where you have to go once you have the idea. Thoughts become things. So you're thinking you want to do this. You're thinking you want to do this. You're thinking you want to do this. What's my formula for making that happen? And the formula is right here in easy to follow uh, instructions. So easy, it's scary. I I have a millennial working for me who I gave the book to uh, two weeks ago. He finished the book yesterday and he goes, okay, I'm ready. I swear to me. He goes, I just finished that book, changed my life. (laughs) <laughs> cool. Okay. And the kid's on fire. I mean, he's he makes sales. He's going to make money, but he is he's going to make money, money. Yeah, he's a yeah. Good. He's a good kid. Love but he it. understood. He understood that this gave him the definitions of some of the things that he had been doing, and the challenges of the things that he had not been doing that he should be adding to his capabilities to to his capability um, uh, curriculum B time. Yeah, totally understood, and and I get that. So now, I, if if anyone that for those that have been listening this far and have been enjoying the, the repertoire and just you, etc., and understanding mm-hmm. everything, well, what's going to be the best way for them to to get a little bit more <laughs> and find out more about what you guys got going on? Well, go to you know go to Amazon and type in the word "get them," or you'll see all my stuff will pop up. Go to my website and. It's Gittimer.com, G-I-T-O-M-E-R.com. I have uh, an online academy. It's called the Gittimer Learning Academy, all one word, dot com. And those are, the, those are the things you'll find. Or listen to our podcast, Sell or Die. It's an amazingly uh, captivating podcast. I do it with, with my fiance Jennifer Gluckow. And it's fun to do. We do it every day. We love what we do. We interact really well. We have amazing guests. You could be one if you want to. Um, Absolutely. Well, you have to qualify. You got to be smart and uh, relatively skinny, and you're good. <laughs> you, you qualify. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, you have to be. You have to be smart, and you have to have an understanding of sales or an understanding of business, so that we can convey some of that message to our audience. And Absolutely. we call sell or die. We call our listeners diehards. Love it. Got a Facebook group, you know, the, the private Facebook group. It's really cool. I mean, it's it's growing tremendously, and it. it hasn't it hasn't even reached anywhere near its potential. I mean, we could easily, if we can do two hundred and fifty thousand um, downloads a month by the end of two thousand nineteen, we could be at a million. Twenty twenty. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there is more than enough interest and enough people out there oh, who are connected yeah. for sure. And podcasts are about to, you know, people think, well, podcasts are really popular. No, no, no. They haven't started exploding yet. <laughs> Don't tell them all of our secrets, man. It's well, all good. Sorry. Yeah. It's, all, it's all good. It's all good. Now, as as we wind down, I've got a final question for you because I am eager to hear your answer. Um, th- th- there is a listener I know right now who is standing at what I like to call the precipice of a decision. In fact, I, you could the also crossroads. Say, I love the crossroads. Yeah, absolutely. They're standing in front of the the superhero outfit store they are ready to pick out their cape and tights and they're like you know what uh-huh. i'm gonna do this entrepreneur thing totally right they're looking however, for a phone booth it, <laughs> they gotta change exactly however you know like i know that when we reach those moments of decisions that precipice there, there's a companion that companion often comes in the form of a voice it reminds us of what we can't do how it didn't work or last spouse time. it could be a spouse and i was going to say and for some people they are related to that yeah. voice Mm-hmm. But this time it's going to be different. This time they they they're gonna they're gonna follow through, and they're going to follow through in the next twenty four to forty eight hours. So my question to you is as follows: What do they do? Rather than foam at the mouth about what they're thinking, try starting the conversation by asking the other person some questions about what they think you are capable of. Because most of the time, people give feedback in terms of themselves, and they think they're better than you. So if you give them an idea and they don't think that they can do it, they're also going to think that you can't do it. Think about that. So I always look at uh, the person's clothing that's giving me the advice, the person's car that's giving me the advice. I want somebody who's driving the $160,000 $160,000 Tesla. I'm going to ask that person. And sometimes you don't want to ask people that you know. Sometimes you want to run it by people that you don't know that are successful. Go to a Rotary Club or a Qantas Club and sit down with someone who's retired and talk to them who have been in business for themselves for 40 years and been successful. Ask them. You know, try to seek wisdom rather than advice. Wow, that's good. I want to. <laughs> He's like, hey, I love it when that happens right there. Exactly. You're like, hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> that that was that awesome. Happened. And and but that's exactly what um I, I think it 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 is totally uh, you know appropriate that that is kind of the the genesis of how a lot of great things come into being. Until the question is asked, we don't know what the answer is, and and then all of a sudden it it, it presents itself, and there it is. With- so the answer is seek wisdom, not advice. Like it. I like it 100%. I just, I just texted it to myself. I'll be tweeting it this afternoon. <laughs> I love it. I love it already. So now, go ahead. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're sitting on the fence, err on the side of what you love and then call some other people who have done what you're seeking to do and ask them what were their biggest hurdles? What was their moment of doubt? What was their moment of joy? Just talk. People will talk to you. And, and Jay, they will love talking to you about themselves. <laughs> you know, meet them at Starbucks. California's a great place for coffee, isn't it? We have enough of, we do have a lot of Starbucks. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so go to, uh, go to, what's it, the city um, just, be, just below the, uh, the airport? Um, Irvine. No, no, no. Below that. On the coast. Newport Lost Beach. Lost something or other? Hmm? No, below Newport. Lost. Yeah, something. <laughs> no, no, the restaurant there is Las Brisas. It's up on the hill. Oh, um, you're talking about... Um, yep, the... I am. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one. Uh, I I know ex- I well, I know exactly. I have it pictured in my head because there's a Starbucks near there that I actually yeah, go to. Exactly. Oh, well, whatever. Um, but you know, wherever you go, seek to look at some water uh, at sundown. Yeah. And you'll you'll come up with an answer. You know, seek some peace for yourself. Find a peaceful place and think it out. Totally understood, and I appreciate it. And I, you know, I, I definitely. 
uh, appreciate the the decades of work that you have put together uh, and the fact that you're out there letting us in with with truthful living let us in, letting us into the hey here's the secret sauce of where the exactly. where it all came exactly. from exactly it's it's my honor to tell you that the secret sauce didn't come from me it came from Napoleon Hill <laughs> absolutely all and, I'm doing is putting in the ingredients and stirring it up with a spoon right absolutely and and that's what I and that's what I appreciate you yeah I mean you have the humility to admit that hey here's where it came from here's what's going down and and you're sharing it with people and as as always I I definitely want to be the first to say I thank you for taking the time to to share your knowledge your wisdom as well as your insight here with us today at the cash flow diary sir it's a pleasure all right ladies and gentlemen you know what time it is it's time for you to move at the speed of instruction what does that mean that means go get a copy truthful living why because you know like i know that there's another thing that you need to go do more importantly learn and most importantly be able to teach yourself how to fish because that's really what we're talking about here today then Get over to Gitomer.com, G-I-T-O-M-E-R.com. Why? Because sales is necessary and you know that your business could use a whole lot more oxygen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. (laughs) 